Welcome to ECE 321 Analog Electronics, lecture number one. Now, in this lecture, we're looking at op-amps. Uh, we'll be using op-amps in the active region to amplify sine waves. The heart of an op-amp is emitter couple logic. That's this circuit. Now, what you've got is a B plus is slightly more than B minus. Say B plus is plus 0.1 volt, B minus is zero. And what happens is this transistor turns on. This one turns off. When this one's off, Vm is pulled high. And that's what you see over here. When Vm is slightly more than V minus, I uh, pull up the plus power supply. On the other hand, when V plus is less than V minus, say minus 0.1 volt, then this one turns off and this one turns on. And Vm, or the output, is pulled low over here. In emitter couple logic, I either want to operate at minus 12 volts or plus 12 volts. Those would be your logic levels. In analog electronics, we operate over here, where the slope between the difference in the input and the output is extremely large, like 200,000. That leads to the symbol for an op amp. An op amp has this symbol that says it's a high gain amplifier, where the output is a large gain times the difference between V plus and V minus. And typically the difference is extremely large. The packaging for an op amp, there's kind of two standard packages. The LM741 has a single op amp in the package with the NE power, plus minus 12 volts, and plus 12, minus 12, plus 22, minus 22. And the op amp, the V minus, V plus, and V out. The ones we use in class are a dual op amp package. And they're pretty much all standard. Uh, almost all dual op amps have the same pinout, so they're interchangeable. We've got the two op amps and the power supply. Now the power supply could either be single-sided, plus five volts to ground, up to plus 36 volts to ground, depending upon the op amp. Or it could be differential, say plus minus 2.5 volts to plus minus 18 volts, your pick. Kind of depends upon the application. If you look at the data sheets for the two op amps, uh, the LM741 is what we use in circuits for some unknown reason. Um, it's a little bit limited. I have to have at least plus minus 12 volts across it for it to work. So it doesn't work very well for things like logic levels. I can't do zero to five volts. It's got a two mega ohm input impedance. The 602, this is really good for zero volt to five volt operation. This is used in embedded systems when I have a microprocessor operating between zero and five volts. We also use that in this class if I only have a single five volt power supply. The input impedance is one giga ohm. It's capable of 50 milliamps. The nice thing is I can have between three volts and six volts across the two power supplies. So zero to five volt operation works. It has a fairly high gain, 500,000. And slew rate, these we'll talk about in a second. The other one we use is the LM833. Uh, this is really used if I have a plus minus, say, six volt power supply. The 602 is rail to rail, so it can go all the way down to zero, all the way up to five. The LM833 needs about a one volt headroom. So if I give it plus minus six volts at the power supply, the output can go between about plus minus five volts. So these are the two that we're using. And then there's the ideal op amp. Now, to illustrate what those different numbers are, I talked about the differential gain. If you build this in circuit lab, you can kind of see what's happening. If I take the op amp and give it a very small signal, say one microvolt at one kilohertz, the output will be like this. It's a sine wave. That's good. It's an amplifier. And the output is 5.5 volts, meaning the differential gain is about 5.5 million. And the 1K resistor doesn't really do anything for you. The op amp is capable of up to 50 milliamps. So as long as I'm drawing less than 50 milliamps, that resistor doesn't really matter. That's the differential gain. That's really how you want to use the op amp. Op amps do have a common mode gain. If I apply the same voltage to the plus and minus input, I ideally will get zero output. In practice, you do get something. For example, in this case, I apply one volt at the input. I'm getting one, two microvolts at the output. So the common mode gain is 0 0.000002. It is there. Ideally, it's not, but it, it actually is there. In the data sheets, they also talk about the slew rate. 
where the split rate shows up is if I have a very high frequency sine wave, I'll get a triangle wave out. This is the slew rate. The output can only change so fast. If you see that on the oscilloscope, I'm getting triangle waves out when they should be sine waves, your slew rate limited. To fix that, I either need to drop the amplitude of the sine wave or lower the frequency. There's another term called the gain bandwidth product. What that means is for this op amp, this has a gain bandwidth product of 2.8 million. I can have a gain of 1 out to 2.8 megahertz. I can have a gain of 10 out to 280 kilohertz, gain of 100 out to 28 kilohertz, and so on. For example, this circuit has a gain of 100. If I apply a 100 kilohertz sine wave coming in, the output should be um, 100 times bigger, 101 millivolts. In actuality, it's only 28 millivolts. That's the gain bandwidth product. At a cut 100 kilohertz, I can at most get a gain of 28 because the gain bandwidth product is 2.8 million. So it's not the circuit that's limiting it, it's the op-amp. Uh, that's kind of important to keep into account. If I have high gains and high frequencies, you can run into that problem. Uh, translating all that, this would be the model for an LM833 op-amp. It has a 1 giga ohm input impedance, that's modeled here. It has a common mode gain of 316,000. It has a differential gain of 316,000, a common mode gain of 3.16. It's 100,000 times less than the differential gain. That's the common mode rejection ratio. And it has a current limit of 50 milliamps, which can model the 200 ohm resistor. So applying that, suppose I had this circuit and I want to find out what are the voltages for the circuit. There's kind of two ways to go. I can use the actual op-amp model, that's what Circuit Lab does, or the ideal op-amp model, which is kind of what we're going to do in this class. What Circuit Lab does is if you have a circuit with an op-amp, it replaces the op-amp with this model, like so. And now you can solve. If we wanted to solve, I've got one, two, three, four, four nodes. I need four equations for four unknowns. One's easy. V1 equals one. Uh, V3 is easy. V3 is 316,000 times V1 minus V2 plus 3.16 times V1 plus V2. <clears throat> Third equation, at V2, the current left plus the current up plus the current down equals zero. That'd be your V2 over 1 giga ohm plus V2 minus V4 over 2k plus V2 over 1k equals 0. And the last equation is at V4, the current left, and current down equals 0. So V4 minus V3 over 200, plus V4 minus V2 over 2k. Four equations, four unknowns. Throw that in MATLAB and solve, and here's what you get. And you get four numbers. Now the problem with the op -amp model like this is it's really tedious to, an op to analyze. This is for a single op-amp circuit, which is actually fairly simple. If you have five or six op-amps, this just gets really cumbersome. That's why we have the ideal op-amp model. The ideal op-amp model says that the gain of the op-amp is infinity. What that means is, suppose the output is two volts, let's say. If the gain is a million, then the difference between these is two microvolts. If the gain is infinity, the difference between them is zero. So when the gain goes to infinity, one property you have is that V plus equals V minus. It's supposed to be P. Uh, that's the equation at the output for an ideal op-amp. You really want to write the node equation at the output, but you can't. I've got this current right here. I have no idea what it is. It's whatever it takes to force V plus to equal V minus. So when you write the node equations, the node equation at the output is V plus equals V minus. So in this case, the equations would be V1 equals 1, V2 equals V1, that's the node equation of V4, and the third equation is right here. At node 2, the current down plus the current up plus the current left equals 0. Uh, the current left, that's 1 giga ohm, well, ideal op amp, that's infinity, so ignore it. So it's going to be V2 minus V4 over 2K 
plus v2 over 1k equals 0. Uh, solving, I get these numbers. And note, the ideal op-amp is very, very close to the actual op-amp. So for most cases, I can just use the ideal op-amp model. It's much easier to use, much easier to solve, and actually fairly close. The limitations, I need to keep the resistors less than about uh, 10 mega ohms. The input impedance is 4 giga ohms. I'm ignoring it. So if you're 10 meg or less, that's not a bad approximation. The maximum current is 50 milliamps. So as long as the current coming out is less than 50 milliamps, meaning keep the resistors bigger than you know, about 100 ohms, then the ideal op-amp op model works pretty well. So for this class, keep the resistors bigger than 100 ohms, less than 10 meg, and we can pretty much use the ideal op-amp model. So again, like I said, uh, the ideal op-amp model is way easier to use. That's what we'll be using the rest of the semester. And again, when you do voltage nodes, remember, if you have negative feedback, the node equation at the output is V plus equals V minus. I want to write the node equation at the output, but I can't. Uh, one reason is they already wrote it. The node equation is V plus equals V minus. The other reason is I don't know what the current is out of the op amp. And I can't sum the currents to zero if one of the currents is unknown. So again, rem remember that. That kind of catch catches people on quizzes. So here's an example. Write the node equations for this circuit. And let's take, you know, like 10, 15 seconds. Let you think about this. You can pause the video to try to write the node equations. Okay, so assuming that you unpause it now. To write the node equations, what I would do is start out V plus equals V minus. I know that V3 equals equals 4. V plus equals V minus. I know that V1 equals 4. That's two, two equations. I've got four nodes. I need four equations for four unknowns. Two of them are done. I need a third equation. I've already written the node equation V2, so let's mark that off. I've already done the node equation V4, mark that off. Those are these equations. The third equation at node 1, currents have to balance. So current left, current right, and current up equals 0. Current up is going to be nothing, so let's ignore it. That's going to give you V1 minus 2 over 1k plus V1 minus V2 over 2k equals 0. That's my third equation. Fourth equation is right here. Current left, current down, current up equals 0. Uh, current left is B3 minus 6 over 1k plus uh, the current down, B3 minus B2 over 1k plus the current up, which is B3 minus B4 over 2k equals 0. Four equations, four unknowns. And that's what this is, four equations, four unknowns. In circuit lab, if you build that circuit and check, you're going to get numbers. If I solve in MATLAB, I'll get the same numbers. Actually, the numbers are slightly different. If I carry this out to six or seven decimal places, circuit lab will be a little bit different because circuit lab actually uses the op model with a four gig ohm input impedance, a finite gain. But if I'm only going to carry it to three decimal places, I can't tell the difference. The ideal op model is pretty close. There's another way to do it. I can use conservation of current. For example, right here, I know that this is 4 volts, so V1 is 4 volts. This is 4 volts, so V3 is 4 volts. If I have 4 volts and 2 volts, I know that this current right here is 2 milliamps. A conservation current, that current has to come from somewhere. That current comes from here. This is also 2 milliamps. 2 milliamps times 2K is 4 volts. 
4 volts plus 4 is 8 volts. So V2 is 8 volts. Conservation of current up here. 8 volts going to 4 volts gives me 4 milliamps. 6 volts going to 4 volts gives me 2 milliamps. I've got 6 milliamps coming in. 6 milliamps have to go out. This has to be 6 milliamps. 6 milliamps times 2K is 12 volts. And so that's 4 minus 12 volts makes Y is minus 8 volts. That's another way to solve. Either way works. Circuit Lab actually uses the former approach. You just do four equations, four unknowns, solve. I can also do it this way. Uh, try to figure out what the voltages are, currents are. The currents have to balance. At any given node, current in equals current out. You can also see what is the current out of this op amp. Currents have to balance. So this op amp is sourcing 6 milliamps. 2 goes down, 2 goes right. This op amp is absorbing 6 milliamps. And with the op amps we're using, they can source or sink up to 50 milliamps. So that's less than 50. This will work. And that's kind of what we just did. A second example. Here's an op amp circuit. Write four equations, four unknowns to solve for V1 through V4. Again, we'll pause this for a little bit. Let you write, write those out. Okay, assuming that you've unpaused it now, I can start writing the equations. The first equation is for each op amp, V plus equals V minus. So I know that V1 equals 6, and that's the node equation V2. I know that V3 equals 8, that's the node equation V4. Again, the node equations at the output is V plus equals V minus. That always holds when you have negative feedback. I've got four nodes. I need four equations, four nodes. I need two more. The next equation is at V1. At V1, the current left plus the current right equals zero. And current down. Current down is zero. So that's V1 over 1K plus V1 minus V2 over 2K. That has to balance. That's got to be zero. And at node three, current left plus current right plus current down equals zero. Current down to zero, so ignore it. That's going to give you V3 minus V2. Over 1K plus V3 minus V4 over 2K equals zero. Four equations for unknowns. Now if this is a quiz, that's where you would stop. On homework, I can group the terms solve four equations for unknowns using MATLAB. And in MATLAB, here's what I'll get. I'll get V1 is 6 volts, V2 is 18 volts, V3 is 8 volts, and V4 is minus 12 volts. That's one way to solve. Uh, second way to solve, oh, second way to solve is throw it in Circuit Lab. And if you note, when I throw it in Circuit Lab, I'll get exactly the same answer. Again, okay, not exactly the same answer, but if you round it to three decimal places, it looks the same. Uh, third way to solve is using conservation of current. Okay, so for this case, what I would do is that V plus equals V minus. V1 is 6 volts, and V3 is 8 volts. That much I know. For current, I've got 6 milliamps flowing through that 1K resistor. That 6 milliamps has to come from somewhere. It's got to come through this resistor. So that's also 6 milliamps. 6 milliamps times 2K is 12 volts. 6 volts plus 12 volts is 18 volts. And now no V2. 10 volts across 1K gives you 10 milliamps. That current has to go somewhere. It's got to go here. This is also 10 milliamps. 10 milliamps times 2K is 20 volts. 
So V power is 20 volts less than 8 volts. V power is minus 12 volts. And if you care, there's also current through this 5K. Uh, 5K to minus 12 volts is 2.4 milliamps. Doesn't really affect anything. If you wanted, I could see how much the op amps are sourcing and sinking. Here I've got 16 milliamps coming out. So this op amp is producing 16 milliamps. Again, current in has to match current out. This op amp, I've got 10 milliamps in, 2.4 milliamps in. The total is 12.4 milliamps. This one's sinking, 12.4 milliamps. And this is one of the reasons you can't write the node equations at the output. I have no idea what this current is. It's whatever it takes to make the voltages balance, and currents balance. And whatever it takes doesn't really help in writing the equations. Again, the node equations for the ideal op amp is at the output, V plus equals V minus. You can calculate it, but I just can't use that node equation at the output. And again, that's just what we calculated. A couple things to note. In analog electronics, we don't need to use the op amps with the plus minus power supplies in the circuit lab. The reason being is, well, as long as the power supply is sufficient to produce these voltages, saying at least the power supply is bigger than 18 volts, probably more like 20 volts, it doesn't matter what it is. 20 volts and higher, let you output 18 volts. In this case, if the minus power supply is less than minus 14 volts, it doesn't matter. The output will be minus 12 volts. So oftentimes in circuit lab, you don't show the plus minus power supplies. That's true for analog electronics when you have negative feedback. In digital electronics, I needed those because when I slam high, I need to know is high 5 volts, 10 volts, 12 volts, what is high. When I slam low, is low 0 volts, minus 12 volts. I need to know that. Analog electronics, it doesn't matter because presumably I'm not hitting the power supply. If you are hitting the power supply, what happens? What happens is this. Uh, this is a circuit with a gain of 2. Okay, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, but take it on faith right now. The gain is 2. If the input is a 1 volt sine wave, and 1 volt at 1 kilohertz, then I've got plus minus 10 volts out. When I simulate it, I'm going to simulation, go under time domain, and give myself something. Hold on. Okay, my plus minus 10 volt power supply. When I simulate, uh, let's do it for 2 milliseconds. That's 2 cycles. With the time step, 2 microseconds, 1,000 times smaller. I want to look at the input and the output. Let her fly. And here's what you get. The input is a sine wave. Output's a sine wave. Output's twice the input. Everything's fine. If I were to say make the input and make it a 15 volt sine wave. So again, in this case, the 10 volt power supply made no difference. It could be 10 volts, 20 volts, 30 volts, no matter. Input is one volt, output is two volts, gain is two. In this case, if we make this a 15 volt sine wave and simulate it, here's what I get. The output is twice the input, but it clips at 10 volts. The output's the, the yellow line. When it goes negative, it follows the input, actually twice the input, then clips at minus 10 volts. Uh, what I want in analog electronics is a sine wave in, gives you sine wave out. If it's not a sine wave, you've got distortion. As long as my power supply is capable of producing that output, I don't really care what the power supply is. So in this case, I want to have 15 volts times 2, 30 volts out. If I were to make this, say, 35 volts, and minus 35 volts, 
assuming the op amp can handle it. It's got to be at least 30 volts to allow the output to be three, uh, 30 volts, plus a little bit of headroom, usually like one or two volts. Then it'll get a sine wave. So likewise, in this class, we don't normally do the plus minus inputs because it doesn't matter what it is. That assumes my power supply is capable of driving that output. So that's lecture number one for ECE321 analog electronics. Uh, again, you note, you don't need to use op amps with the plus minus power supplies in circuit lab. In actual lab, you do need power. Op amps don't work without power. And also, it doesn't really matter if you use the wrong op amp. For example, right here, this is a TL81. If I were to change that to, yeah, pick your other paper op amp. Um, well, I've got plus minus 12 volts coming in. LM741, let her run. Same result. Op amps are pretty close to ideal, and so likewise, it doesn't really matter which op amp you're using, as long as the op amp is capable of operating over that power supply range. Again, the 741 needs at least plus minus 12 volts to operate. The MCP602 can operate at most 6 volts differential between it. The LM833 is anywhere between 5 and 18 volts between the two. So, as long as you satisfy that, the op amps are interchangeable. Power supplies don't matter. So that's lecture number one.